slowly learning a lot about the last little while. Uh, there's a lot kicking around in my head, so I kind of figured I had to make a visual so I kind of kept it all in some coherent order. But what I'd like to present to you guys today is uh, what I've been learning from a man named Charles Eisenstein and his book called Sacred Economics, Money, Gift, and Society in an Age of Transition. Uh, it is a look at our current economic system, where we've gone, where we're at, and presents a new model that we could potentially move forward from. And uh, I'm a BCom student at the University of Calgary, so I've taken a few economics courses, and all through uh, the courses that I've taken, I could never really find an interest in it because I always found that there was something missing. It really, to me, missed sort of that human element. Um, that I found in this book and this information. So uh, it's going to be a really quick overview. Uh, there's a lot of material in here. It's really hard to cover in a short amount of time, but I'll do my best. So, and again, as you guys are uh, listening to some of this, it might sound hopelessly idealistic and uh, unrealistic, but. Uh, instead of trying to listen and pay attention to the potential cynicism in your mind, feel the truth of it in your heart and see if you might see a world that presents and lives this way. So I wanted to talk a little bit about money to start off just to kind of give a background. So what is it? Uh, it's very interesting that there are a lot of connections between what we view money as and what spirit is. Uh, a lot comes, everything comes from money, everything can be returned to money. Uh, money can build skyscrapers and makes the world go round. And another interesting connection between the two is that they both kind of came about around the same time. Uh, back in ancient Greece uh, when the idea of the soul and the the self came into being was around the same time that money came into being. And before that, a lot of the uh, views of the gods were that they were a part of nature and that they were nature, not separate from these overlords that ruled over top. So the power of money is an interesting idea in that it is able to accomplish superhuman feats that no one individual is able to accomplish. And it's also interesting in that the desire for it is unlimited. There's no end to the desire that people can have for money. The people who have money just want more of it. So, how do we put the story of money that we've created into a new purpose? And the power of the symbols comes from the power of the stories that we tell about them. So, money you know, used to be a lot more in the physical realm, but it's pretty much moved into the, interior, the immaterial realm. It's entirely symbol, it's just digits on a computer. Some very small percentage of money is actually uh, physical bills or physical coins. So, there's a couple stories that I want to talk to you guys about that kind of wrap up and uh, what Charles Eisenstein calls the stories of the people. And there's two aspects of this. The first one is the story of the self and the other one is the story of ascent. <coughs> the story of the self has to do with what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to exist on this planet? And for quite a while now that has been uh, a worldview of a separate self. In psychology, you are a bubble of psychology in a prison of flesh interacting with other bubbles of psychology. Um, you are separate from your body, you're separate from other individuals. It's expressed in biology, you're the expression of selfish genes here to maximize their potential. Uh, in economics, you're a rational actor seeking again to maximize self-interest. and. These are, this story has pervaded for a long time and we see it shifting now. So we are realizing that we are interconnected to other people. What I do to you, I indirectly do to myself. Um, in biology, we're finding out that ecosystems are incredibly uh, interdependent. 
the, a loss for, of one individual. It's not, hey, there's less competition. It's a loss for everybody. And it weakens it. It weakens the whole system. And the other story is the story of the ascent. And this story uh, basically means that man started uh, helpless and ignorant. And over time, we have developed our capacities to um, to overcome this, we've gained knowledge and wisdom and technology that have helped us to overcome and conquer nature and this will be finalized as one final, you know, we've ha we have complete control over nature, we use the resources in whatever way we need to and it will be completed in some final transcendence of earth, we leave it behind and we don't need it anymore. And money has embodied both of these stories. <clears throat> it embodies the story of the self and the separation in that it homogenizes everything in our life. It homogenizes our commodity items. So we take less care of the items that we have, the materials that we have, because, oh, we can just go buy another one. It's all the same. And it also homogenizes people. Uh, there is this, I believe that there's this underlying um, idea that in any social gathering that I don't need you, I can pay somebody else to do it for me. I don't need the person to, who grows my food, I can pay someone else to do it. I don't need the person who built my house, I can pay someone else to do it. And this infects most aspects of how we interact with everybody. Whereas it didn't used to be like that. In a small town or a rural community, if you upset the one doctor, it wasn't good news. You had to maintain relationships. And in a gifting economy, when you give a gift to somebody, you create a bond with that person in a relationship where you generate gratitude and the other person desires to give back. And in a money transaction, as soon as it's exchanged, it's done, it doesn't matter anything beyond that. Sorry? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and then the other story, the story of the scent is the endless growth, where uh, essentially money is created through interest bearing debt. And I'll just do a quick explanation. I think everybody has an idea of that, but. If I um, were to give out a million dollar loan, it would be created through an accounting ledger who says a million dollars into your account, it doesn't get taken out of another account, and then there's uh, a balance owing of 1.5 million payable in five years. And uh, if everybody takes out a million dollar loan, the, t the total money that is owed back is always going to be more than the amount of money that's actually in circulation. So five years down the line, two thirds of the people aren't gonna be able to pay back their money. Well, where does it come from? Well, we could take it from you, or we can do what we've been doing all for the last little while is creating more money. We just create more, we lend it back out, so then in 10 years we're gonna have the same problem. And this, In order to have this endless growth that we've had, we have slowly been taking everything that has been once free and part of gifting and turned it into money. So in the goods realm, we've been taking our forests and chopping them down, turning them into board feet and turning it into money. We've been taking the ocean's carrying capacities into an annual catch and then turning it into money. We've been pulling oil out of the ground and turning it into money. Obviously, we live on a finite planet. This cannot continue forever. In the realm of services, um, childcare, you know, neighbors used to look after each other's children after school uh, as favors. They, you know, you get fed. Now there's daycare centers, uh, singing. Kids used to sing on the bus to school. I don't think that happens anymore. You know, it, it's been turned into an industry. Imag imagination, uh, you know, once kids used to play on the streets and create amazing imagination 
these worlds that they play in, and now it's purchased in video games and um, created imaginations and worlds. So, what happens when there's nothing left to turn into money? When uh, we've taken all of the caring capacities and all of the things that used to be once part of the gift economy, the, the business model that's pervaded up until this point is find something that people do for each other for free, take it away from them, and then sell it back to them. So, and I, I believe that this is what's underlying the crisis that we're coming up to and feeling the effects of is that we're reaching the end of growth. We aren't able to grow as much and the attempts to get us out of this by putting money back into the hands of the banks has only, it, it's been too risky. There's no goods and services to turn into money anymore. So that's why uh, most of the big money plays have just been in the financial markets. There haven't been any new goods and services created. So it might not sound like good news, but it's all part of a process and it's part of a larger story. It's the humanity's story as it goes through its maturation from childhood into adulthood. So, up until this point, humanity has been in childhood. We've been in receiving mode. When a child is born, your natural state is to receive. You receive from your parents. They're happy to give. They don't ask for anything in return. Um, and they're happy to give it. This is how humanity has been uh, in relation to our planet or our Mother Earth. We've been happy to receive and the planet has been happy to give back to us. As you reach the end of childhood and youth, you start slowing down in your growth. Your growth finishes, you've had a good chance to play around with your gifts and try to figure out what it exactly it is that you are able to do. And some sort of crisis happens, um, a disintegration of your identity. Uh, and I feel our society, especially here, has lost that aspect. Uh, we had a score back in February on rites of passage, where most cultures through history have had some sort of coming of age ordeal where they would be taken from their home and you know, uh, go out on a vision quest or fed psychoactive plants or uh, the elders would come and beat drums on a night and scare you. So your identity falls apart and you are welcomed back into the community afterwards into adulthood. And we are coming to that stage now, I believe, where our relationship to the earth is changing. So as we become adults, we no longer feel um, like it's our right to take, but we also want to enter into a co-creative partnership where we want to give back. We fall in love with our planet, we want to give back in whatever way that we can. And I believe that's where we're going. It started uh, back in the 60s with the environmental movement. And I really see this is where we're going. You know, it's not about, um, it's not about undoing everything that we've done so far. It's about completing this evolutionary process that humanity is going through. So, what would money like if it embodied the new adulthood of humanity, where a loss for one is a loss for the whole. Part of this shift um, is a shift in our values. And, you know, what would it look like if we valued the flow and the sharing over the accumulation, the giving? What would it look like if we valued community and these are things that we can start living today. We don't have to wait for anybody to make any sort of policy changes. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about something, <coughs> some ideas of these, but. The change in values is really just a shift in mindset in how we react, interact with each other. And so some examples that I wanna talk about um, I have to be totally honest, I'm only about halfway through the book, 
so I haven't got to everything yet, but <laughs> one of the things that he talks about is negative interest rates. So the idea that I have 50 loaves of bread, I would be happy to give you some of that bread because in two days it's going to go stale and I'll just keep what I need. So, and then trusting that when you have more than you need, you will give back to me. This is how the universe works. Um, it's not supposed to be a struggle in wanting to give. You know, how many times do you have, oh, I wish I could do that, but I just don't have the money. I wish I could give to you, but I can't afford it. Um, so negative interest rates would be a way to get money flowing back out into uh, the areas where people need it. Money should be a means of connecting gifts with the needs of the people. So it's not a total advocacy for a removal of money. It's important for directing um, what people need to be working on and where needs are needing to be met. Um, another idea is the idea of a time exchange program, which we've been slowly starting up here in Calgary, but it's a very simple idea in that everybody is equal, so everybody's time is equal. My one hour is the same as your one hour. So um, when you sign up, you can say what you're able to do. Maybe you're a plumber, maybe you like to help out with um, housework, or you can do accounting, or whatever else. And then you can put all of that on there, and then when somebody needs it, they go on and look, and they find you, and they go, hey, I need somebody, and it works as a credit system. So you have one hour, and then you can use that one hour to go and find somebody to come and cut your hair. Because the, the need to start doing things like this, to remove things from the commodity market and put them back into the realm of the public market and giving, is that it not only hastens the fall of the system that we have right now, but it also mitigates the severity of it. A lot of people are saying, oh, go and invest in gold, buy gold, you know, whenever something happens, gold's always there, you know, but it's, it's still the same, it's still a story about it, the story about the gold. Whatever you're backing the money with increases demand for it. So if money is backed by gold, all of a sudden we're putting tons of resources into extracting gold, there's markets for that. So it, uh, is it possible to back our money with things like um, fresh air, uh, forests, um, and other natural resources, because if we back somehow back it with that, then it increases the demand for those and we want to protect those. So the best investment that you can make right now is the investment in community, in creating a community. Because as you remove as you remove those things from the commodity market, you're, you're speeding up the end of the growth. And, the, and you're making yourself secure because you have people that will uh, look after you and you're able to give to them and they will give back to you. And we live in, abundant, in an abundant world. It's just the scarcity mindset that has been created by the money system just is not true at all. There's enough for everybody on the planet, not one person excluded. Um, and then the other example was uh, gift circles, which cultures used to do, and I can now speak from personal experience because we tried one last Friday. And those that were there can attest, it was an amazing experience. Uh, you get a group ideally 10 to 20 people, and you try to meet every week. And then there's three rounds that you go around in the circle. So the first round you go around, everybody says two or three things that they need in their life. And at any point, if somebody has one of these things, they can jump in and say, I have that, let me offer to you, and you can move on from there. The second round is uh, a round of giving. So if you have a couple things that you're able to give. And this can be anything, if you need a ride to the airport, if you need a bike, if you need someone to look after your kids, whatever it is. 
uh, there were a lot of different examples that came up when we did ours. Um, and actually, it, it was really, it's an interesting exercise to do because it's difficult initially to get into that mindset of, oh, well, what do I need? What can I give? And we're trying to extend it to things like singing or maybe you're great at giving hugs or, you know, like everything, everything that everybody has gifts. We're here to give our gifts back, you know, and to be free to do that to, and be able to do that without restraint. So, and then the third round of the gift circle is a round of gratitude where you go around and you uh, say what you're thankful for, for the people who have given to you and who you've received from in the previous week. And this will motivate and inspire people to continue to give because when you see people giving, it inspires you to give more. And I can speak for that personally, having been down at the Occupy for the last few days here. The amount of giving has been incredible. And it, it has a, a certain quality to it, a nourishment that I've never, it, it's really hard to describe until you experience it. When you give so much, it, it just fills you up. It fills you up. You know, I, I really wasn't eating very much food when I was down there. <laughs> <laughs> to be quite honest, I, and not that I wasn't starving myself, but I just wasn't hungry because I was just filled up in other ways. <laughs> So, so I encourage you to start a gift circle. Uh, we're going to try to keep it going every week, and you have to follow up on it. Because again, the stories are only as powerful as we make them. So we have to make them powerful. And if it's not successful, then it can develop cynicism and uh, not work out in the way that it's supposed to. So invest in community. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to put up a couple of the links if anybody's interested. This book is available, I think he's up to about the 12th chapter. He's putting up one chapter a week, and it should be done by the end of the year. But it's available for free online, or you can purchase the uh, print copy if you're interested. But I just wanted to finish with uh, a little end of a section that he had here. And then I'm going to put up the links. Uh, he's got an article on the gift circles that explain that and the time exchange link as well. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> this might seem hopelessly naive, vague, and idealistic. For now, Weigh your competing voices and your, of your idealism and your cynicism and ask yourself, can I bear to settle for anything less? Can you bear to accept a world of great and growing ugliness? Can you stand to believe that it is inevitable? You cannot. Such a belief will slowly but surely kill your soul. The mind likes cynicism, its comfort and safety, but hesitates to believe anything extraordinary. But the heart urges otherwise. It urges us to beauty, and only by heeding its call can we dare create a new story of the people. We are here to create something beautiful. I call it the more beautiful world our hearts tell us is possible. As the truth of that sinks in deeper and deeper, and as the convergence of crises pushes us out of the old world, inevitably more and more people will live from that truth. The truth that more for you is not less for me. The truth that what I do unto you, so I do un unto myself. The truth of living, what you can and take what you need. We can start doing it right now. We are afraid, but when we do it for real, the world meets our needs and more. We then find that the story of separation embodied in the money we have known is not true and never was. Yet the last 10 millennia were not in vain. Sometimes it is necessary to live a lie to its fullest before we are ready to take the next step into truth. The lie of separation and the age of usury is now complete. We have explored its fullness, its farthest extremes, and seen all it has wrought, the deserts and the prisons, the concentration camps and the wars, the wastage of goods, the true and the beautiful. Now, the capacities we have developed through this long journey of ascent 
will serve us well in the eminent age of reunion. Thank you.